Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Again, this is the beginning of a sermon series called Walking in the Spirit. Today's message is entitled, The First Three Steps of That Walk. And our text is in Galatians chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 14. I'll read the New King James Version. If you're there, say, I'm there. And it reads, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. So here's the solution. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Everybody say that with me. Walk in the Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now this is our text verse. So I want you to underline it, put a star beside it, highlight it. Because we're going to come back to this a number of times. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh lusts. That word lust can be uh, interpreted as wars. The flesh wars against the Spirit. And the spirit wars against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other. So that you do not do the things that you wish. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. If we get to you, just say amen. Amen. Jealousies. Albert. This is nothing to be proud of, folks. This is <laughs> some of y'all are elbowing your neighbor. Yeah, that was me last week. I did all of those. No, this is nothing to be proud of. I, I had some junior high boys when I was a principal that, yeah, they'd be raising their hands. But this is not you. Say, this is not me. Verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, and it goes on, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not, everybody say not, not. inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, now it's interesting, in verse 19, he says, the works of the flesh are, but in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is, so you see a tremendous contrast between two different lifestyles here. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control or temperance. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And the church said, Amen Amen and Amen. Now, Paul is writing to the region of Galatia, to the churches of that region. He visited that region on his first missionary church, uh, missionary trip, and churches were planted as a result of that. And now he's writing a letter to those churches, and this letter will be circulated among the churches so that all the Christians in that region can receive the edification. And really, in this letter, and it is the first letter that he has, his first epistle, that we have in the New Testament written by Paul. And it's very telling that it is his first because he deals with two fundamental questions. Question number one, what constitutes salvation? And the answer is faith, nothing but faith. Are you with me? That's a good place to say amen. amen. Second question is, what constitutes victorious living? And the answer is walking in the Spirit. So what constitutes salvation? Faith. Nothing but faith. What constitutes victorious living? Walking in the Spirit. See, Paul was dealing with the question of salvation because at that time, the Jewish uh, Christians, Christian people who had a Jewish background, who became believers in Christ, received Jesus as their Messiah, they believed that when the Gentiles 
came into the faith that first, in order to be saved, they had to become Jews. In other words, they had to come under the law. They had to receive the right of circumcision. And then they could believe in Jesus Christ. And Paul refuted that adamantly. He said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. In other words, with the crucifixion of Christ, everything has been done that needs to be done in order for you to be saved. You don't have to do anything else. Jesus did it all for you. You just have to, by faith, receive the work that Jesus did. There's no work left for you to do. Salvation is by faith. It'll always be by faith and only by faith. And that formula will never change. It doesn't need to because Jesus on the cross did everything necessary for you to be saved. Amen. 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 Verse 2, Galatians 3 and 2. This only I want to learn from you. So he's saying, I need you to tell me this. I don't get what you guys are doing. I, I need you to tell me this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, he's saying, how would you get born again? Did you get born again by the Holy Ghost or by doing some work of the law? How, how did you do it? Well, the answer is by faith. So he goes on. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? In other words, why, when you're born of the Spirit, would you turn to a life of ritual and ceremony and legalism, trying to perfect your salvation, when really, when you're born of the Spirit, what you need is more of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. We need to grow in the Spirit. We don't need more ritual. We don't need more ceremony. We don't need more religion. We need more of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. If you're born of the Spirit, what you need more is the Spirit. Yeah. Come on, church, say amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. So in Galatians 5 and verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. I'm so glad I'm free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In other words, if God has set you free, don't submit yourself to some religiosity which is just going to get you all bound up in the traditions of men. You just need to stay free in the, in the Holy Ghost. Indeed. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Salvation is a function of faith. It will never be a function of faith plus anything else. Paul is saying, no, you do not add circumcision to your faith as being a function of salvation. It doesn't make any difference. You got saved by faith. The modern day church does exactly the same thing in many different ways. I've told you before, I was sitting at an airport one time and reading my Bible and a fellow came up to me and he said, tell me how you get saved. And I said, oh, that's easy. Galatians, I mean, Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gifts of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It, it's a gift. It's not of works. It's a gift. It's by faith. It's through God's grace. It's by faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He says, no, you're wrong. You have to be water baptized. I said, no, you're wrong. It's by faith. He says, no, you're wrong. You have, to, you, you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. I said, no, you're a Galatian. That's, no, you have to be circumcised. Well, today, no, you have to be water baptized. I'm not speaking against water baptism. Water baptism is a very good thing. It is a public profession of your faith. But it doesn't get you saved. It gets you wet. Come on, say amen. 
I don't, I don't care what you do to this outward flesh. It's not going to get you saved. You can dip it in water. You can dress it up. You can cut your hair a certain way. You can put on your clothes a certain way. I don't care how long your robe is. I don't care how many stripes you got on your arm. But if you're not saved by faith, my friend, then you're not saved. Let's not change the formula now. Paul said you don't have to be circumcised. I say you don't have to be water baptized. You should be water baptized. It is a public pro proclamation of your faith. But it comes after your declaration of faith. Read the book of Acts. They were saved. Then they were water baptized. They were saved, spoken in tongues. And then they were water baptized. Come on, church. Are you with me? Are you with me? Praise the Lord. If we change it, he says, you're fallen from grace, which is a tremendous doctrinal statement. Adam fell from grace as the federal headship of mankind. Man fell into sin through Adam. It is possible to fall. Come on, say amen. amen. It's possible to fall. It's possible to fall. So question number one, what constitutes salvation? It is faith. Question number two, and this is our, our sermon series, what constitutes victorious living? It's walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5 and 16. He, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the problem is, the Galatian problem, and the problem that remains today, is the balancing act that we try and strike between the flesh and the Spirit. We, 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 we like our flesh because uh, sin is fun for a season. It's pleasurable for a season. We like the appetites of the flesh, but we want the blessings of the Spirit. And so we want to do a little bit of flesh, and then we want the blessings of the Spirit. We just want to figure out how do we balance the two. Let me tell you, there's no balance. There's no balance. Because one cancels out the other. And that's why Paul says, and I'm, I'm going to read five, Galatians 5 and 15 from the Amplified Version. And you listen to this. This is the Amplified. It says, for the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. Flesh being godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other continually withstanding in, and in conflict with each other so that you are not free but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. There's a war going on and it's going on inside of each of us. It's the war between the spirit and the flesh. The, the thing is, now we're not talking about the flesh as in the skin on your body. We're talking about, about the flesh as in our carnal nature, our ungodly human appetites. That's what the Bible calls, you, calls your flesh. The war going on between the flesh and the spirit is something that's going to have to be settled out in our life. we got to decide, are we going to come under the authority of the Holy Spirit or are we going to keep caving to the appetites of the flesh? Come on, church. And they, and they war with each other. Here's the deal, though. We lived in the flesh for so long before your spirit was regenerated, before the Holy Ghost moved into on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit started talking to your human spirit. You were completely governed by the flesh. All of the worldly appetites that were out there fed your sensory inputs, and you just went with it. You said, I like the look of it. I like the sound of it. I like the way that makes me feel. And your flesh ruled your life. But when you came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moved in on the inside of you for the first time in your personal history, you started hearing the voice of God because the Spirit of God started speaking to the spirit of man and instead Instead of hearing the voice of the world, you started hearing the voice of God. And all of a sudden you realize, hey, wait a second. There's another way to live this life. There's another opinion I should be listening to. James said, all that is in the world, I mean John, 1 John 2 and 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's not of the Father, but that's of the world. We call that worldliness. Worldliness. It's not of the Father. It's of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's of the world, and it's all flesh. It's all flesh. 
It's all flesh. And it's got to come under the authority of the spirit man. Hallelujah. Don't forget in Galatians 5 and 21 it says, Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here's our choice. Either we choose to live according to the flesh, or we choose to live according to the spirit, or we try and balance it somewhere in between. There's a, there's a phrase for that. It's called carnal Christian. Try to balance it somehow in between. Keep our carnality, but hope and desire for the blessings of the Lord. Come on, you with me now? Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But the solution is found in our text, Galatians 5 and 16. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? When you walk in the Spirit, same as praying the Spirit, singing the Spirit. When you walk in the Spirit, what that really means is you are governed by, you are directed by the authority of the Holy Spirit. You are bringing your life under the authority or the direction of the Holy Spirit. His voice is the voice. His desire is the desire. In all these years, I've been filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. And the longer that you walk with the Holy Spirit, you begin to realize that, oh, that's the voice of God. That's the voice. Some people call it a check in your spirit. Some people call it the inner voice. And God can speak to you through a burning bush. He can do whatever He desires to do. But most often, that He'll speak to you through the Holy Spirit and you, you'll, you'll hear in him that uh, no, I don't want you to be subject to those appetites anymore. I don't want you to surrender to that lust anymore. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to go there. Or I do want you to be over here. I do want you to devote your life to this. And you begin to realize, oh, that's the voice of God. I'm hearing God speak to me right now. Are y'all with me? Do you understand? Yeah. Debbie and I have two little dogs. I talk about them a lot, but they're completely driven by the flesh. There, there's, there, there's, there's no spiritual redemption there at all. I love them with all my heart and spoil them terribly, but they are driven by their appetites. They're driven by the flesh, and they, they love to eat. And if, I could, if they could eat more, they would eat more. And uh, they're fed about three times a day, and their last meal of the day, we call it the midnight snack, but it, it's at 8.30 in the evening. And by about 7.30, they believe it's 8.30. And uh, I have to tell them it's not 8.30, girls. It's only 7.30. And they'll lie to me. They'll say, no, it's 8.30. I, I say, I, I come against that lying spirit right now in Jesus' name. And, and, uh, but they'll lie. And, and if I feel them early, they'll run tell Debbie it, they haven't been fed yet, that they need to be fed again. And so they're very manipulative, but, but uh, what, I, what I do, what I do is to get them over their appetites, what I do when they come at 7.30 instead of the 8.30, I'll look at them because they'll, they'll, they'll bark and they'll tell me, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I'll, I'll, I'll clap my hands, I'll clap my hands and I'll say, tut, tut, empty hands. <laughs> this works with children as well. It does not work with husbands, however, because <laughs> Debbie's tried it on me. It doesn't work. But it works with small animals and children, not husbands. But I'll clap my hands. I'll say, tut, tut, girls, empty hands. And they'll, they'll trot off because they understand the em I have no food in my hands. They'll get that. Well, listen, we need to say the same thing to the appetites of our flesh. There's things we, need, we just need to say, no, I'm not going there anymore. No, I'm not doing that anymore. No, I'm not thinking that way anymore. I'm not talking that way anymore. I'm not living my life that way anymore. No, and you got to say it to your flesh. you got to tell your flesh. And that's why David spoke to his soul. He said, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. you got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you got to be your own cheerleader, but sometimes you got to be your own disciplinarian and say, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm a man of God. I'm a lady of God. I'm a person of God. I'm a child of the living God, and I want the blessings of the Lord. I want God to open the windows of heaven over my, over my head, and I'm not going to be the stumbling block. I'm not going to be the hindrance to the blessings of the Lord. So I say no to the flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, don't you know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? It says, don't you know that? Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, when Jesus went into the temple, what did he do? He went into the temple in the beginning of his, his ministry and cleansed the temple. Went into the temple at the end of his ministry and cleansed the temple. When Jesus went into the, to the temple, he, he said, what's of God, what's not of God? This is my father's house. This, this has my father's name on it. I want all you money changers out of here. I want all you merchandisers out of here. And he, he made a, a whip. He started turning over tables. He ran them all out. Can you imagine one man running them all out? But they knew, don't mess with Jesus. Don't mess with Jesus. <laughs> It, when Jesus throws you out, it's time to get out. And so he threw him out of the temple. Well, when the Holy Ghost moves into the temple, your body temple, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's going to get rid of some stuff. He's going to bring some stuff in. He's certainly going to get rid of what shouldn't be in there, and he's going to bring in what should be in there. So you can expect when the Holy Ghost comes into your life, you should expect your appetites to change, your desires to change, your vision to change, your lifestyle to change. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There is no function of your Christian life that does not originate with an operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to follow with me for just a second. Because we start out, we as Christians, we are born of the Spirit in John chapter 3. But then we worship God in the Spirit while directed by the Holy Spirit, John chapter 4. We're directed and helped by the Spirit, John 3. 14. We're taught by the Spirit, John 14, baptized and empowered with the Spirit, Acts chapter 1, set free by the law of the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, filled with the love of the Spirit, Romans chapter 5, led by the Spirit, Romans 8, sanctified by the Spirit, Romans 15, told the mind of God by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, become the temple of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, justified by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, given gifts by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, sing and pray in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, changes the image of the Lord by the Spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, liberated by the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, live by the Spirit, Galatians 5, speak by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, manifest, manifest spiritual fruit by the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, walk in the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, unified in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, equipped with the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 6, receive great revelations while in the Spirit, Revelations 1, and hear the Spirit, Revelations chapter 2, glory to God. All that is by the Holy Ghost. So your first three steps of walking in the Spirit then begins with step number one. And here's step number one. Honor the person of the Holy Spirit. Honor the person of the Holy Spirit. I say the person of the Holy Spirit because he's the third person of the Godhead. He's called a person because he has personality. The Father is a person. He has personality. The Son is a person. He has personality. The Holy Spirit is a person because he has uh, personality. When Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit, he referred to him as a person. In John 15 and 26, he said, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He, He, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, will testify of me. I asked Debbie on the way down. I said, uh, Debbie, when I talk about honoring the Holy Spirit, what does that mean to you? She says, very simply, it means that I love what He loves and I hate what He hates. Isn't that good? It's the way we honor the Holy Spirit. You know, who, who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please anybody but the Holy Spirit? So number one, we need to honor the Holy Spirit. Number two, and in that number one, let me just say that when we started this church, God spoke two things to me in, in separate dreams. Uh, the first one was, he said, build a house of worship and uh, worship in spirit and in truth. And that's why we do that in every single service. The second thing he said to me was reveal the Holy Spirit. And so in every church service, in every function of this church, we give preeminence to the Holy Spirit. He gets preferential treatment in the house. So if the Holy Spirit wants to change the service in some way, in some manner, uh, we let him change it. He, he can do whatever he wants to do. We are not ruled by program or agenda. We're ruled by the Holy Spirit. And so if he wants us to pray all service, we'll pray all service. If he wants us to worship all service, we'll worship all service. If he wants us to run the aisles or dance around, we will be led of the Holy Ghost. 
whatever the Holy Ghost wants to do. Because, number one, in our walk of faith, if you're going to walk by the Spirit, you have to honor the Spirit. You have to honor the person of the Holy Spirit. I remember watching a uh, great revival with, with uh, Benny Hinn ministering to thousands and thousands of people and people were falling out under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and uh, I heard him say under his breath, thank you Holy Spirit. And he wasn't saying it to anybody else. He wasn't talking to anybody else. It just sort of got picked up by his lapel mic and man, I just focused in on that. He said, thank you Holy Spirit. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Catherine Kuhlman used to say, don't, what she used to say? <laughs> oh, like y'all know, stop that. <laughs> what did she say? I was going to say, don't take the Holy Spirit. And I thought, no, that's David in the Psalms. <laughs> the, don't grieve my Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's more real to me than you are. We got to honor the person of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. Number two, step number two, find a spirit-filled church. I said find a spirit-filled church. Hey, I think you found one. Praise the Lord. We need to be planted. I believe every Christian needs to be planted in a church that welcomes the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to honor the person of the Holy Spirit and we're going to say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. And he is the honored guest in the house. Shouldn't we welcome the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ? Listen to me. Listen. This is it. If the Holy Spirit is to rule this body, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is supposed to manifest in your body and rule your body and have His way in your body, should He not have the same liberties in the body of Christ when the church gets together? Let me tell you, we're called the body of Christ. We're not called the body of Jesus. We're called the body of Christ for a reason. Because it is a reference to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Christ means the anointing. And so we're called the body of Christ because this is where the Holy Spirit operates. Hallelujah. So you might say, well, well pastor, our church focuses on the love of God and the, the peace of God and the joy of the Lord. Yeah, but those are all fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, our church focuses on, on service. Yeah, but you can't serve God without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. You need the anointing to serve God. You say, well, our church uh, focuses on the Word of God. But the Word of God is authored by the Holy Spirit. There's no activity that you can pick that doesn't go back and have its roots in the Holy Spirit. So I say, let's just let the Holy Spirit have His way in the church. I, I believe every Christian needs to find a good Spirit-filled church because as we're growing in the grace and knowledge, as we're growing in our spiritual callings and our gifts, we need to be in an environment that allows us to grow. I remember uh, when I was coming up in the things of the Spirit, I got into a congregation. Debbie and I got into a congregation where the river was flowing. And therefore, I, I didn't know everything there was to know about the Holy Spirit. Still don't. But I have more familiarity now. But back, th back in that, day I needed to be in an environment where in my in my youth in the Lord that I could just flow in the river that the environment that was set by those who were mature in the Lord set uh, allowed the river to come in so all I had to do was get in the river and let it carry me and that's when I got developed in my gifts and callings in the spirit the Pentecostal church, the Spirit-filled church, is the church of atmosphere where there is great expectations. Anything can happen. Miracles, signs and wonders, giftings and callings, uh, the manifestations of the Spirit. And you need to be in an atmosphere where there is great expectation. Every time Debbie and I come to church, we expect something to happen. 
Every time we come to church, we expect God to heal a body, change a life, renew a soul. We expect God to do something amazing and magnificent within that church. We don't come to just do church. We don't t- come to go through the motions. We come with expectations. I- I'm telling you, church, I want to see the glory in the house. I want to see the Shekinah glory in the house of God. Hey, if Solomon had it in the temple and it was so weighty and it was so heavy that it knocked the priests down that they could not even minister before the Lord because it was so weighty, the glory was so thick. Why not in the New Testament? Why not? Why can't the glory fill the house once again? I want the fire on the altar. I want the Holy Ghost in the house. I want the rain poured out. I want the river to flow. I want to see a church that is Bible-believing and devil-chasing and blood-bought. I want a church that's alive in the Holy Ghost. I want to see people that want to worship and want to pray and want to get free in the Spirit. I like people that have freedom in their feet, got a little bit of shout, a little bit of fire in their bones. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Paul said it himself in Galatians 3 and 5. He who supplies the Spirit to you works miracles among you. Hallelujah. Step number three. I'm closing on this. If step number one is honor the person of the Holy Spirit, step number two is find a Spirit-filled church. Step number three is receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You need a fresh outdoing, a fresh outpouring every day. Because we need power to serve. We need power to obey. We need power to excel. We need power to witness. We need power to pray. We need power to live in this world. Come on, say amen. Amen. We need power to do all that God has called us to do. We need power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, it's not by strength, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. If we're going to do great things for the Lord, we got to get out of the way so God can do what He desires to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I I believe the baptism with the Holy Spirit is an essential because Jesus said it is, is an essential. So very often in the body of Christ, people look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit as, sad, as sort of an add-on. It, it, it is an option, like you get options for your car. It's an option in the body of Christ. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll pay for that option. No, 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 no. Jesus says, listen, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But he said in Luke 24, 47, he says, don't you dare. Don't you dare leave Jerusalem. You tarry until you... You be endued with power from on high. He said, you can't do this ministry without the Holy Ghost. You need power to do this. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And every Christian should be baptized in the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Every believer receives the Spirit when they are born again. But there is a second additional work and operation of the Spirit, which is called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And every believer needs the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. You need to speak in other tongues. You need to worship in other tongues. You need to have that operation in your life. Why? Because praying in the Spirit is praying the perfect will of God. And that is the prayer that always gets answered. Hallelujah. Step number one is honor the Holy Spirit. Step number two is find a Spirit-filled church. Step number three is receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, those are the first three steps. Did you get anything out of this today? Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me?